I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, Phil Davies. We've known each other for what, maybe a decade? Seven, seven years, exactly. Seven, oh, not, not that anybody's counting. <laughs> um, but he's actually been in the business of uh, transport economics and port-related economics, uh, international trade economics for quite some time. Um, and uh, he's been up in Canada. We actually met uh, when you were doing a project on the Vancouver port, right? Uh, true. Uh, we were, they were, the Canadian government was looking at best practices of port operations mm -hmm. around the country, uh, or around the world, and they came to Southern California because of some of the things that were happening in Southern California at the time. Uh, so, uh, I'm not going to sit here and do the lecture. That's your job. Um, and what we're going to talk about today is macroeconomics, the sort of general economic climate and port competitiveness. And with that, Phil, thank you for coming. Oh, well, my pleasure. I'm, I'm honored to be here. As, as Jen mentioned, uh, I've been a Metrans fan since 2005. When I was, was actually the uh, director of research for the Ports Trucking Task Force, which was looking into the trucking strike at the Port of Vancouver in the summer of 2005 and we, uh, we made good use of some of the uh, groundbreaking research that Metrans had done, particularly uh, Professor Monaco's uh, research on the drainage sector here in Southern California. <coughs> so uh, and in, uh, in fact in our recommendations for the task force we recommended they set up something similar in the Lower Mainland but uh, that's one of the recommendations they didn't actually uh, implement. Uh, so, just to set the stage, I know that port competitiveness is a matter of great uh, interest here in Southern California, as it is basically in any, every port community in, in North America. Um, I, uh, I actually watched the webcast uh, of this, uh, of this uh, session and found it very interesting. Uh, but, as is very common, uh, the webcast on the, and this session focus very much on the things that can be done here within Southern California. So my, my presentation will take a bit broader look at uh, what happens elsewhere and, and uh, what the strategic implications may be for port, uh, the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach. So uh, here's the outline of my presentation. Basically, I want to talk about the, uh, the current conventional wisdom on port competition, which um, is primarily the work that was done by uh, Robert Leachman for the Southern California Association of Governments. Uh, and some for the uh, Washington State Legislature. <clears throat> and I want to talk about how that uh, was influential in terms of the recently concluded uh, Federal Maritime Commission inquiry into the harbor maintenance tax. Um, I want to give an example of uh, an alternative way of looking at port competitiveness um, with a demonstration of the work that I've done on, on the uh, lower mainland container traffic, which is the Port of Vancouver. Um, and I want to apply that uh, same methodology to uh, Los Angeles and Long Beach uh, and talk about the kind of strategic implications that may have for very important strategic questions like in, uh, infrastructure investment um, in the region. Um, I, have to, uh, I have to disclose my, uh, my, uh, my preconceptions. I was brought up in a small town in the province of Saskatchewan. My father was a grain farmer. And uh, for uh, for generations, it was a uh, it was a it was a truism that the West was always being screwed by the East with the help of the railways. So <laughs> you take that take that into consideration as I go through my presentation. Um, the other thing I make mention is that my first professional job was in strategic planning with the Potash Corporation of Saskatchewan from '81 to '87, and at that time, the uh, two Canadian railways had joint rate making authority. Uh, so it was an unpleasant time for a major bulk shipper. So, uh, how many of you are economists? <laughs> oh, this is going to be popular. <laughs> yeah, 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 you know too much. I just, uh, I just want to go by and 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 just breeze through this because um, some of you may not uh, know that there are different kinds of economics. Um, and uh, I touch on these in the course of my presentation and, and contrast them a, a little in terms of methodology. So microeconomics is basically the behavior of households and firms, supply and demand within individual markets. Um, industrial organization is a branch of microeconomics dealing with imperfect competition or market power. That's been fairly um, um, 
unfashionable for some time, but it is in fact a theory that's still used by regulatory bodies like the Federal Maritime Commission and the Surface Transportation Board. Uh, macroeconomics is the study of national economies at the aggregate level. Um, and econometrics is the use of statistical tools to measure economic variables. And one of the key uh, concepts for this, uh, for this presentation really is price elasticity, which is the sensitivity of demand to price changes. So basically, it's, it's just the percentage change in quantity over the percentage change in price. Basically, if, if demand is elastic, if you have a 10% increase in your, in your price, that means your, your quantity will fall by more than 10%. If it's inelastic, if you have a 10% increase in your price, then quantity will fall less. <clears throat> so, you know, the methodology that I've used for this and, the, and for the Canadian studies I've done really uh, has to deal with significant challenges in terms of uh, obtaining data for, for purposes of doing the analysis. Um, there is some data available from commercial sources. It's very expensive. There are sources like Peers, uh, IANA, uh, Global Insight, uh, who will sell you data. Um, Statistics Canada, who will sell you data, very pricey. And, and in some cases, you, you really need to find a way to work around the cost of the data, particularly when you're doing independent research. So, for example, you will see in my, in my analysis of Canadian imports, I've used value rather than quantity. That's because when I put in my request for data on import quantities, uh, Statistics Canada quoted me a price of $13,000. So I took a less expensive route. <clears throat> the other issue is that uh, some of the data that's available may be unreliable uh, because of the way it's collected. You have, to, you have to look very carefully at the data you're getting so you can understand. And I've got uh, the example here. Uh, in 2004, Statistics Canada uh, data said that 42% of Canadian imports from China to Canada were arriving by truck. Well, I was, I was the senior West Coast economist, and I knew there wasn't a highway. And that was actually the, um, the, the um, anomaly that started me doing work on, on the port competitiveness. <clears throat> uh, and the other issue is uh, data may be completely unavailable. Uh, confidential commercial data. Um, and with regard to port competitiveness, I would say the single most uh, s uh, severe uh, limitation is the fact that you have no reliable data on the inland destinations of the tr port traffic that comes through the various ports. <clears throat> so uh, the conventional wisdom on West Coast port competition really has been set by uh, the Leachman uh, studies. Two for the Southern California Association of Governments here, phases one and two, and the uh, Washington State Freight Investment Study, which was, uh, in which, uh, was done with Cambridge Systematics. Basically, the, kind of, uh, the model was a microeconomic model. It was looking at choices of individual shippers. Um, the methodology was to, uh, to look at a cost minimization for shippers based on transportation and inventory costs by mode, um, IPI, which is inland point intermodal, which is uh, uh, transportation of uh, marine containers, long distances inland, uh, transload or local. Um, the difference between the phase one study and the phase two one is the first one was, uh, long, uh, was uh, unconstrained, uh, which is to say they didn't look at uh, capacity of other ports to take traffic in the event that it was displaced from here. And the phase two uh, also looked at short-term elasticity and the phase one model was used for the Puget Sound ports. And those models resulted in, you know, uh, very high estimates of elasticity of traffic, which is to say for, for relatively small uh, r increases in costs, they showed very significant uh, declines in import traffic through the ports. Uh, and of course, the most extreme example of that was uh, the Puget Sound ports where they said, uh, you know, $60 in FEU would, would lose them 30% of their import traffic. So the FMC inquiry was started uh, last year, uh, primarily to complaints from elected representatives. Uh, I think there was one from California, but it was primarily from the Pacific Northwest. And it was focused on the effect of the harbor maintenance tax on the diversion of cargo. And I can just outline the sort of the logic and, and, and in fact, the, the Leachman model was specifically cited by the, uh, the Port of Seattle in their submission to the inquiry. 
Um, and it was also cited by the Washington Public Ports Association in support of the contention that the harbor maintenance tax was causing significant diversion of cargo to Canadian ports. Um, do you want to just explain to the group what the harbor maintenance tax is? Yes, the harbor maintenance tax is an ad valorem tax that's, that's, uh, that's uh, uh, charged on uh, imports through, uh, through U.S. ports. Uh, and basically it's uh, nominally used to fund uh, waterway improvements. Um, so, I mean, the, the logic of the FMC inquiry was really, you know, from, from the Leachman elasticity uh, estimates for the Pacific Northwest, it was that the traffic is very sensitive to increases in costs. $60 would cause a 30% traffic exam or, or decline. The, um, the harbor maintenance tax actually averaged $89 per, per, per FEU. So imports through Canada were exempt from the HMT. They're coming across the land border. So that meant that Canadian ports must have a cost advantage relative to the Pacific Northwest. And in fact, as evidence for that, they pointed to the fact that Canadian ports share West Coast container uh, markets had been increasing. So, you know, the, the logical conclusion for them was that the HMT was diverting their import traffic uh, from the Pacific Northwest. So the FMC concluded their inquiry in July, um, and what did they find? Well, they found that Canadian ports' share of, of U.S. imports was rising, but it was, in fact, still significantly below where it had been in 2000. Um, and I, I point out that, in fact, that the FMC had to rely on Canadian data for this finding because there was no uh, accurate U.S. estimates of what these numbers actually were. The other findings were that uh, Prince Rupert costs are lowest in terms of uh, traffic to the Midwest, which was a surprise to the Port of Prince Rupert, to me as well. Uh, the Prince Rupert transit time was comparable to U.S. West Coast ports, which was also a bit of a surprise to the Port of Prince Rupert and to me, since most of their submissions said, from shippers said that was why they were using it. Um, but the other conclusion that they, that, they, that they had in their report was that based on the Leachman model, 19% of Los Angeles Long Beach import traffic and 26.7% of other West Coast port traffic is vulnerable to diversion. And this relates to the IPI traffic, which is, uh, which is uh, transported in, intact in marine containers. <clears throat> so you can see what, ha what, what, what happens is, is a kind of almost circular logic, which is to say they, they, they believe that imports through Canada are exempt from the HMT, but in fact, the Canadian ports share of West Coast uh, imports into the U.S. has actually fallen from what it was in previous years. So then they also, but but they circle back to the Leachman model to say that in fact that the traffic is is high elastic and it is subject to uh, to uh, construct uh, competition from the Canadian ports. Now, <coughs> that's. Um, I should mention, that, though, that the FMC inquiry was not a unanimous report. Some of the commissioners disagreed with this conclusion. So I want to turn to some of the research I've done on, on lower mainland container traffic and, and look at two of the uh, assumptions or, or, or contentions in, the, in the, the logic behind the FMC inquiry. And the one is the question, is uh, the Canadian share of Canadian ports increasing? And the second one, if so, is it due to lower relative costs? So Canadian ports market share, uh, measured as the share of uh, total TEUs on the West Coast, you can see that Canadian ports share has definitely increased over that period from about 9% uh, to 11% for Port of Vancouver. And uh, of course, the Port of Prince Rupert is up almost to almost 2%. Though, of course, if you start from zero, whatever you take has got to get some market share. <coughs> um, so yes, uh, on that measure, the uh, Canadian ports market share was increasing. Now the question is, was that due to a cost advantage? And I looked at the, the, the and particularly, and the issue around macroeconomic impacts, was it reasonable to think that the Canadian ports had actually uh, increased the cost advantage over this period, which allowed them to capture the market share from the, uh, from the US ports? And the major macroeconomic uh, variable affecting the, the relative position of the Canadian ports is the exchange rate. And you can see in 2002, the Canadian dollar is worth only 64 cents US. 
and it's now, in fact, above par. Uh, so the value of the Canadian dollar increased by more than 50% over this period. Now, how would that affect the port costs? Well, definitely the inland rail costs, because the uh, CN and CP are paying their employees uh, in Canadian dollars. Uh, port costs, um, which uh, are not really dealt with in this presentation, one because there's no reliable data, the other one because those are generally rolled into shipper costs. Uh, and ocean shipping costs, and, and really we don't expect the exchange rate to have much of an impact on that because all of the rates to Canada aren't quoted in U.S. dollars in any case. So, so the focus is on the rail cost. So this graph sort of shows the, the impact of the, uh, of the exchange rate uh, increase on, on the uh, Canadian Railway's revenue per carload, which is basically the price they charge their, uh, their customers. And you can see from uh, 2002, when, when the Canadian cost was really only 70% of the U.S. cost, uh, it's, uh, it's now par. Now, these, this data is actually uh, taken from the, uh, the Class 1 Railways uh, Western U.S. Class 1 Railways and CN and CP uh, financial reports on their average revenue per carload. <clears throat> now, uh, it's, a, it's a valid question whether or not this is representative of, um, of uh, the uh, IPI rates, but I have some uh, information on that later on the presentation. Yes? Have anyone interviewed the shippers and found out how they thought? Oh, my God, you have all this data. Yes. Would you mind as shippers? We know people don't necessarily change because of price. They have all sorts of other uh, fixed assets, habits, whatnot, all right? Maybe over 20 years they'll change, but, you know, what do we know about that? You're anticipating my conclusion. <laughs> we'll get to it. <laughs> yes. Um, so the comparison, uh, Western U.S. railways and, uh, and Canadian railways in U.S. dollars, you can see that over this period uh, there was a, a dramatic increase in the, cost, in the rates charged by the Canadian railways, uh, particularly in the first few years. Um, but the other, thing, the other uh, aspect of macroeconomic variables is they have broad impacts throughout the economy. And, and the other major impact uh, the appreciation of the Canadian dollar had on was the, on the amount of uh, products which were actually imported from Asia. So you can see that uh, this, this is actually the value of imports from Pacific Rim countries, for U.S. and Canada. And you can see in domestic currencies the, uh, the rate of growth was similar right up until 2011. Um, but in fact, if you look in U.S. dollars, the... Um, the level of Canadian imports grew much faster than, uh, than in the U.S. Now, under the, what I think is the reasonable assumption that the, that the composition of this uh, traffic was, uh, was similar, that would mean that the quantity would increase as well as the value did. So I tried a regression analysis, uh, really looking at if I could explain why, uh, why Canadian imports grew so much more rapidly. And uh, a very simple uh, uh, linear regression using uh, two variables. One is personal disposable income in Canada, and the other one is the ratio of import to domestic prices, which of course is affected by the exchange rate. And I came up with a, with a, uh, with a regression, which really actually is a, is a very good fit, um, and uh, proper signs, proper statistical uh, tests of significance. Um, so, I think it, it does a reasonable job of explaining why Canadian imports grew so quickly. So then I thought, well, let's try a regression analysis on the, on the share of, uh, of container traffic that the, that the Port of Vancouver gets. So we look at comparative inland costs, so we look at the ratio of Canadian rail rates to U.S. rail rates, and we looked at the share of uh, North American imports uh, from uh, into Canada. So, so over that period of time, of course, because Canadian imports grew more rapidly, uh, the share of Canada in North American imports grew, and of course, the, uh, as did the uh, Canadian-U.S. Uh, rail cost ratio. And that fits pretty good, too. Um, so the conclusions from that analysis is basically that the lower mainland share increased in spite of uh, uh, higher costs due to the exchange rate, simply because 
the, uh, the higher value of the Canadian dollar increased imports more than they lost. Um, so uh, from that equation, you can calculate a partial elasticity with respect to relative rail costs, which are about 0.3. And actually, I woke up this morning thinking this is the wrong number because I haven't put in a fuel surcharge on the ocean cost. But if you change that ocean cost rate to $1,800, which is probably reasonable at this point, the uh, price elasticity is actually 0.75. So that tells you that, uh, you know, based on the economic de uh, definition, the uh, traffic is in fact uh, inelastic. Now, compared to the Leachman estimates, uh, and these are the calculations that are made by the FMC on uh, long-run price elasticity of IPI traffic is 15. So uh, 20 times basically what my finding was for the Port of Vancouver, and. Uh, for the uh, Pacific Northwest ports, it was 20. So it raises the question, why, why is elasticity so low for traffic coming through the port of Vancouver? And in order to look, we, we, we turn to industrial organization and look at market power. So the major markets are in Eastern Canada, uh, population is highly concentrated in Southern Ontario, and Toronto is the major market, Toronto and Montreal, basically. Um, Intramodal competition in the Canadian market is limited because there's no direct access for any U.S. Class 1 railway into the major Canadian hubs. Um, in fact, there's no intramodal facility owned by a U.S. Class 1 railway in Canada, uh, though that is now changing because the uh, CSX has an application before the Canadian Transportation Agency to build an intramodal facility in Valleyfield, Quebec. Uh, I think it's 70 kilometers south of Montreal. So that will be interesting to watch. And because of the long distances, intermodal competition from trucking is, is, is very difficult because the costs are so high. So then the question was, the, 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 the regression did show there is a negative impact from increased costs on, on the Port of Vancouver's traffic. So the question is, okay, well, where did that traffic go? So in order to do that, you have to really look uh, through the data and try and figure out what's going on. And, if you measure cargo, not containers, if you look at Canadian imports from Asia um, and not port traffic, uh, you find that in fact the, the share by value entering Canada by truck through four major land border crossings grew from around 15% in 2002 to 20% uh, in 2011. So um, basically it means that Canadian ports lost 5% market share in the Canadian market over that period. Um, which puts a different complexion on the issue of port competitiveness. So if you, it, it makes a significant difference if you count, you count the cargo. Now you see the, the um, and, and here the market share is done on, the, on a value basis again because of data costs, but you can see the, the increase, and these are the only the, the four top border crossings in Canada, and all of this traffic is by truck. Um, whereas the, the data that was accepted by the FMC on the amount of Canadian imports transshipped uh, through U.S. ports shows a decline. Uh, and there's a reason why there's very few containers transshipped, and the reason is for the lack of direct rail access. With the exception of CP Rail, which has direct access to the port of New York, New Jersey, um, they, uh, the U.S. railways do not have direct access. They would rely on an interline agreement with CN and CP if they were going to send intermodal traffic by rail into Canada. And somehow or other, it appears they've never been able to agree on a rate. So just to get a sense of where those border crossings are, uh, and you can see the two largest are the Blue Water Bridge and Ambassador Bridge, which sort of lie on the route between Chicago and Toronto. Um, uh, the Peace Bridge, which is between New York, New Jersey and Toronto. And of course, the Pacific Highway crossing uh, between uh, um, Seattle and Vancouver. Um, but you can see, and, and here's, here's where, where we start thinking about the, the impact of inland networks. The railways you see in the U.S. there are the U.S. Class 1 Western Railways, UP and BNSF, and you can see that the closest, the closest rail terminus to those, uh, to those points is uh, Chicago. So, from Chicago to Toronto is about 520 miles by truck, so it's nine hours plus border delays in terms of the trucking. So it's a bit of a mystery how Canadian shippers could find this route cheap, either cheaper or faster, which suggests to me that there are 
other issues which are affecting their choice of ports or routing. So I'll turn now to the, uh, the ports of LA and Long Beach. Um, and it, when I started looking at this, of course, I was, I was kind of surprised that there didn't seem to be any standard measure of what the share of the ports had been. The most, recently, the most uh, frequently quoted one appears to be Piers data. Um, for my purposes, what I did was I, I took the um, Census Bureau data on containerized imports from the Pacific Rim countries. And uh, um, so these are the uh, percent by weight. So it's basically tons of imports. So, you know, on that basis, and, and I've only concluded the Pacific Rim countries because I don't think that the executives at the Port of New York, New Jersey, stay awake at night worrying about the European traffic being stolen by West Coast ports. Um, <clears throat> But so you can see that, in fact, there has been a fairly significant decline in the ports of LA and Long Beach over the last nine years, uh, from about 57% down to about 50%. Um, maybe 1% decline for the port of Seattle. So I, I had a look at, I thought it would be very interesting to look at where that traffic had gone. And um, I cheated a little bit. I put in the Canadian ports numbers from the, uh, from the uh, FMC inquiry didn't really change too much. Um, so you can see that uh, LA Long Beach have lost over 6%. Um, Puget Sound ports have lost about 1%. The big winner is the port of New York, New Jersey. And for the rest, I mean, many of these ports have been uh, cited as uh, major competitive threats to, the, to uh, Southern California, most particularly Savannah. Um, um, Houston, not so much. But you can see, in fact, what's happened is that the share has really been widely distributed across uh, the, the port uh, system in the US, which maybe makes it a little harder to figure out a way to fight back. Um, but you want to know where your traffic has been going, that's where it is. So in returning to the Leachman model, we look at, see, they, they have uh, basically two major uh, variables determining the routing of port traffic. One is uh, inventory cost, which is a function of the transit time and reliability. And the other one, of course, is transportation costs. And, and really, the, the choice between the West Coast and East Coast is usually characterized between higher transportation costs and lower inventory costs via the West Coast, because it's more rapid transit time, uh, and lower transportation costs and higher inventory costs via the East Coast. So there, there are, uh, as well, macroeconomic variables that affect the competitiveness of ports within the US. And I thought, for a start, we might want to focus on the interest rate impact on, on inventory costs. This is the, uh, the formula which is used to calculate uh, inventory costs in the Leachman model. And you can see uh, the amount of capital, the, uh, the uh, capital tied up in safety sock. But most importantly, the interest rate enters into both these terms. And the interest rate is essentially the price of holding inventory. What's happened to interest rates? Interest rates are now less than half of the rate that they were in, uh, in 2007, which was the last date where the Leachman costs were, uh, were estimated. <clears throat> so uh, all things being equal, you would normally have expected that that might result in a shift of traffic, or a fairly substantial shift of traffic to the East Coast, since their inventory costs for longer transit time had decreased. Now, I have to say there is a qualifying factor in there through the introduction of slow steaming, which has, in fact, had a differ differential impact on increasing transit times to the East Coast. <clears throat> but the question is, you know, what is that a strong relationship? You would expect because it, whenever the interest rates are high, the uh, the share of the ports of uh, LA and Long Beach would be high because because the shippers will take advantage of lower inventory costs. So the relationship is positive, but it's weak. Uh, the coefficient is about coefficient of correlation is about 0.18. So the, you know that's the major macroeconomic variable I think that that calls into question the uh, the. Um, the Leachman results. Now, the, uh, now we go back to the issue of industry structure and the level of competition within the various various modes of transport. Um, and uh, industrial organization looks at uh, cost structure, 
uh, market structure, the number of firms to, to draw conclusions about how competitive the industry is likely to be and how much uh, market power they will have. Market power being, in this sense, the ability to raise costs above uh, what would be uh, the price level in a competitive market. So basically, you can see that, that for, for steamship lines, they have high fixed costs, um, but, but low variable costs. What this means is, some degree, they can, in fact, lower their prices uh, when, when they're in a downturn because uh, as long as they're getting some contribution to their high fixed costs, it still makes sense to, to, to sell the product. Barriers to entry are low because anyone can build a ship, really, and deploy it on any route throughout the, throughout the world. Uh, number of firms in the market, well, the numbers in the Trans-Pacific Stabilization Agreement on the Trans-Pacific, 15. Um, and our pricing power, I'd have to say, is low based on what we see in terms of the container rates that, and, and the trajectory since, uh, since the downturn in 2008. <clears throat> the railways, on the other hand, have high, also have high fixed costs and low variable costs, but they have very high barriers to entry because it's really difficult to build another intercontinental railway, or you don't have intercontinental railways. It's, it's hard to build another railway to the Mississippi. Um, and uh, the number within any individual market depends you know, on the routing. Uh, for example, in Vancouver to Toronto, there's only two. Uh, but uh, to uh, Chicago, from almost anywhere, there's six. But so that leaves them with a much higher level of pricing power. <clears throat> uh, trucking, low fixed costs, high variable costs, that means they can't lower their prices very much because then they're losing money uh, on a cash basis. Uh, barriers to entry, very low, thousands of firms, almost no pricing power. You go down to it. So. I, I wanted to see what had happened to the cost amongst these various components of, of shipments to, uh, to the eastern markets uh, over the period since, uh, since 2007 when, when the Leachman estimates were last prepared. Um, the numbers don't add up exactly or line up completely because I've used, uh, I'm, in the cost analysis I'm going to use, I'm using Leachman's 2007 numbers. These indexes are based on 2008 and the reason they're based on 2008 is the Trans-Pacific Stabilization Agreement started publishing a, an East Coast and West Coast shipping line uh, revenue index um, based on the second quarter of 2008. And their index starts the first, uh, first month of 2010. So it shows uh, the differential um, change from, from 2008, uh, basically, for West Coast and East Coast uh, ocean rates. And you can see that the rates had recovered to more almost uh, previous levels uh, by 2010, three quarter, third quarter. But since then, they've fallen down. So East Coast rates are about 22% less than they were in the second quarter of 2008. And uh, West Coast rates about 15% or 16%. The problem with, with, with the data is you never get exactly what you want. And there is a component of IPI rates in the, uh, in the TSA West Coast uh, figures. So that may overstate the, uh, the level to some degree, uh, looking just at shipping costs. But you can see that uh, trucking costs fell at maximum by about 10% and have since recovered to the levels that they were at basically in 2008. Whereas the, the rail rates, and this is the UP intermodal revenue per carload, uh, have gone up 22%. And this is generally bad news if you're dependent on the railway and you're competing against people who are more dependent on the shipping lines. So just a question about how representative the data is in terms of the, using the average rail revenue per, per carload. Um, I took the numbers that I've been using in my analysis, which are the, uh, the financial figures uh, for the uh, Class 1 West Coast Railways and compared them to the FMC data, which was actually extracted from the Surface Transportation Board waybill sample. And you can see it tracks reasonably well, uh, more closer to the PNW rate than the, uh, than the LA Long Beach rate. Uh, but oddly enough, uh, those rates keep climbing uh, and the average revenue uh, declines very significantly uh, as a result of the downturn. So if the FMC numbers are right, it would really imply that the US railways had continued to increase their prices on the IPI traffic. Um, I'm not confident they are right. 
But the other interesting thing is, if you look at those rates, you can see the widening gap between Pacific Northwest rail rates and LA Long Beach rates. And if the Port of Seattle wanted to look at why they may be losing market share, they might have a look at that. So in order to try and quantify this to, to some degree, I, I took the Leachman cost estimates from the, the phase two study, which was uh, basically dated 2007, focused on the Midwest Atlantic region market and look at the changes in cost components on rates and surcharges. So this is basically the market that I'm looking at, which is the, probably the most hotly contested intermodal market and thought to be the one most in play uh, with the expansion of the Panama Canal. Chicago, uh, Cleveland, Columbus, and Ohio, Pittsburgh, and Harrisburg, and Pennsylvania, and New York. So here are, are Mr. Leachman's cost estimates. And these are, these are the lowest cost estimates for, from his study. And these are per 40-foot uh, equivalent. Uh, and you can see that, uh, in general, the uh, uh, West Coast, uh, LA Long Beach, had an advantage in terms of costs as far uh, east as Pittsburgh. So it was really the port of uh, New York, New Jersey, and uh, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, which is also in very close proximity, which, in which the uh, port of New York, New Jersey, had an advantage. <coughs> you notice the differentials are um, not monumental. So in order to figure out what, what had happened to the competitive position based on the changes in the various cost components, I, 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 look, I focused on the, the changes in cost to the basing points. Now basically basing points, Chicago is the basing point for, uh, for, uh, for containers coming from LA Long Beach because they had to go to Chicago to get through, uh, and New York of course for, uh, for coming on the East Coast. So if we look at the, uh, from the, the, the transportation cost changes from the, uh, from the rate indexes, and, and the reason why we had to, uh, required some, some calculation, because the TSA has given us an index based on the second quarter of 2008, but they haven't given us any numbers to tell us exactly what the rates were in the second quarter of 2008. So those uh, I have uh, estimated from, from the Leachman estimates. So, but, but you can see that the changes, uh, the relative changes based on these uh, data sources. Um, uh, and, and these were applied to the uh, components and then the, the, uh, of, the uh, of the costs and then, and then subtracted. Uh, we subtracted those uh, other components to, to estimate an ocean rate. <coughs> uh, oh, actually, I should point, there's one thing that's very important to point out though. Uh, the bunker surcharge, there was a major change in the bunker surcharge in 2009 TSA, um, prior to 2009 TSA actually charged the same bunker surcharge for West Coast and East Coast traffic. In 2009 they implemented a new system for bunker surcharges which took into account the longer distance uh, for, uh, and higher costs for, uh, for the East Coast shipments. Well, the result of that was that the uh, bunker surcharge increased by 74%. Uh, in, uh, on the East Coast traffic and it actually declined by 11% uh, for the West Coast. So that was one area where uh, the cost changes went, uh, went in favor of the West Coast. So here, basically, I applied these, these costs to the 2007 estimates <coughs> uh, and to estimate the, the ocean costs. And these are the, the ocean costs here would be the rate uh, net of uh, bunker surcharges or inland surcharges. Um, and then looked, applied the, the changes in the, in the uh, transportation costs by index to, uh, to the various components to come up with another estimate of the uh, ocean costs. Um, and that's the result, but basically what that says is that an average, uh, average decline in, in costs or prices uh, for Chicago via New York, New Jersey by $374 an average decline 191 from LA Long Beach, which leaves basically a net uh, benefit to the, uh, to the Port of New York, New Jersey of $180 a 40-foot equivalent unit. 
I don't expect you to follow that too well. <laughs> so what does that mean in terms of the change then in the competitive balance in, the, in this market between uh, the port of LA, Long Beach, and the port of New York, New Jersey? Well, you can see in, in uh, 2007, it showed that there's about a $750 advantage for the West Coast routing for Chicago, declining to about, um, I think, $96 by Pittsburgh. Um, and then, of course, for Harrisburg and New York, it was still uh, significantly cheaper to ship through the port of New York, New Jersey. Well, with the cost changes and, and because of the, particularly the escalation of the rail rates, uh, by 2011, the, the data suggests that uh, New York, New Jersey now has an advantage as far, far west as Pittsburgh, and in fact, the, that they're pretty close to par on at Cleveland and Columbus. So if you take those numbers and you look at the change in the uh, Leachman's model is it calculates the, the, the reduction in, in volume from the baseline. Now if we take the baseline as the 52% market, 0.7 percent market share in 2007 down to the 50.2% the in 2011, we've got a change of 4.8% in market share. $182 on an average 4,000 per TEU, so it gives us an estimated elasticity of 1.05, which is elastic. Um, but it's significantly less than Leachman estimated in his microeconomic model. We recall that the estimate was 15, so it's uh, an order of magnitude uh, less. And also, you know, I think based on the uh, trajectory of interest rates over that period, the linkage to inventory costs is, is not well demonstrated either. But I think that the, the strategic issue uh, is uh, the market structure of inland transportation networks. And the reason why uh, the Port of Los Angeles and Long Beach are disadvantaged over the last uh, four years, or does that make five, um, is because the railways raised their rates and everybody else lowered theirs. So, when you understand the way railways work, and I do, <laughs> well, I don't actually, well, I know what happens. Um, you know that the ports of uh, Los Angeles and Long Beach, um, Beach need direct rail access to the eastern markets, and, and now they get that through interline agreements with uh, CSX or Norfolk Southern, which is to say the originating carrier sets a rate, which is, is a through rate to the final destination. They negotiate a rate, uh, a rate um, uh, uh, the shares of the rates that go to each of the two railways. And that's a confidential agreement, and the, and the, and the, and the amount that goes to each railway is never, never divulged. So the traditional uh, strategy of the Eastern Class 1 railways is in part uh, a function of the fact that they are facing much greater competition from trucking because they have a much lower length of haul. Um, they didn't have that high a market share in hauling the uh, containers from the, uh, from the East Coast ports. So, you know, we have this statement by the CSX CEO. He prefer West Coast port growth to East port because shipments from the rest less likely to be ordered by trucks. If you find that very reassuring, you probably don't need to listen to the rest of my presentation. So what's changing in the new environment? One is lower ocean shipping costs to the East Coast following expansion of the canal. We're presuming that there will be lower shipping costs. The, the, the level of the, ca the, the canal tolls is, a, is another issue which uh, leaves a lot of uncertainty. The other issue is there have been major investments by Norfolk Southern and, and CSX to improve their intermodal corridor linkages from the East Coast ports. And we're talking billions. And their strategic uh, plan is to uh, actually go very strongly after the trucking uh, they think that they're in a good position to do that now because they have lower costs and the truckers have very high fuel prices. So you can see that uh, that, that is already, uh, 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 those efficiencies are already being uh, realized to some degree. So this second quarter, 2012, they said they've increased the, uh, the uh, double stack percentage from 77% of their cars to 87% of their cars, the most cost effective means of transporting. So if I was an East Coast Railway, I would think that there would be a possible strategy of negotiating an increased rate division on West Coast traffic, which is to say I would go to uh, UP and BNSF and say, I think we need a larger share of the rate. 
Now that's that's a win-win. That's potentially a win-win situation because you know, insofar as the traffic keeps coming from the west coast, they get more revenue. Insofar as it drives traffic to the east coast, um, they they're in a much better position to take that traffic from the east coast ports to inland destinations by reverse IPI, which is a new word, a new phrase to me. <clears throat> So, you know, at, at the extreme, you may be looking at a new frontier, basically the terminus points for the Western Railways, where high internet line costs make it impossible for them to compete uh, by direct rail, and that they would have to transload from truck in these locations. This seems extreme, but it's exactly the situation with Canadian imports into Toronto. <laughs> Obviously, uh, there are constraints on the, on the Eastern Class 1 pricing. They, they have competition between the two railways. They have competition with trucks. And they still have to maintain commercial relationships with the, uh, with the Western Railways for domestic interline traffic in, in any case. So there are, it's not, they are not monopolies. But for that, just to think, look at the, the potential impact of this, what I did was I looked at the... Uh, in incremental costs from Chicago to, to the Midwest uh, destinations, and these are taken from the Leachman figures, and you can see that it's basically linear, and that the costs are uh, relatively small. I mean, from uh, Chicago to Cleveland or Columbus, additional $287 per 40-foot equivalent uh, unit. <coughs> and it's, it's uh, essentially linear uh, in distance. So the interline costs on a linear regression, 86 cents per mile, per 40-foot equivalent unit. Uh, trucking costs, there's a company called Transfast in Kansas City, which publishes current rates on truckload. Truckload rates, uh, those are the 2012 estimates. Adjusting for trailer capacity, trucking costs are $1.11 per mile. Long haul, $1.51 per mile sh short haul. So if we look at the, the possibility that uh, shipments to the eastern markets would have to be transloaded to be competitive from the west coast. We can look at the, the, uh, the cost estimates that Leachman did in 2007, looking at the differential between direct rail IPI movements and transload rail 53-foot containers. And you can see uh, that the, the, the differentials uh, vary a lot amongst those. Uh, you can see, because and, and for Leachman's model, transloading is transloaded in the Southern California area. So, so the, the, uh, <clears throat> so the uh, product is actually transferred from a 40-foot container into a 53-foot container and, and taken by what it becomes domestic intermodal uh, to, to destination uh, <clears throat> by direct rail. Uh, now, if we look at what the, what the impact of actually having to uh, transload and truck from Chicago, and those, that, that last column is basically the incremental cost of trucking everything from Chicago, based on current rates. You can see we get a quite different view of competitiveness. If they had to truck from Chicago, they're at a significant disadvantage in every one of those markets except Chicago. And their advantage in Chicago has declined considerably. Now that's probably a, a bit of an extreme case, but I mean, as I say, there are sort of two options for transloading uh, freight, and one is the one that was examined by the Leachman model, which is transloaded in, uh, in Southern California, then you have a dray from the port to a transload facility, distribution center, you have uh, transloading costs, you have a dray to the, to the rail yard, you have the, uh, the rail costs for a 53-foot container, which is domestic, uh, and then you have a dray to the destination, which would be a long-haul dray. Um, the other alternative is to send your 40-foot containers to Chicago, transload them in Chicago, where particularly with their highly developed uh, logistics parks, they may be able to get by with a very short haul dray, transload the truck, and send it on to destination. So which of these models is going to prevail? Well, drayage costs are going to be a factor. Uh, the rail rate differential between 40-foot and 53-foot containers uh, is going to be a major factor. And this is where the pricing strategy of the Western Class 1 railways enters into the risks. Um, presumably, if they're going to use more 53-foot containers, someone would have to pay for them. Um, which one will prevail? Which option provides the lowest cost to shippers? Which option makes most money for the railway? So I looked, uh, BNSF has a handy little device on their website called the 
BNSF intermodal advisor where you can look up uh, relative trucking and, and uh, domestic intermodal costs. So these are uh, Los Angeles to Columbus door-to-door -door intermodal. Um, we, they, they estimated a uh, truck rate. I've converted all these to 40-foot equivalents, so they're comparable. Uh, trucking cost, about $2,700. Standard service, uh, close to $2,000. You notice that there is a substantial differential between the FMC rate uh, estimate from the Waybill sample of $1,220 uh, IPI to Chicago and the, uh, even the standard service is almost $800 in terms of the additional cost for using a domestic container as opposed to a 40-foot. Uh, a so what are the strategic implications of that? Well, if they're going to have to do more transloading, the question is, what should you focus your investment on? Are you going, do you want to make it easier to ship IPI containers direct from the port to Chicago? Uh, or do you want to try and make it easier and cheaper to translate in Southern California? Um, <clears throat> and you might look at, certainly if you're doing on-dock rail, that's great for IPI traffic. If you're doing, uh, you know, freeway improvements and uh, industrial land development or the distribution centers, then, then that's transload. And then, you know, it may be that you have enough money you can do it all and see which way it shakes out. The other question is, uh, you know, there's uh, a big buzz about inland ports now, very substantial investments in intermodal facilities in, uh, in many uh, places, certainly in Chicago, Kansas City for BNSF, uh, in major investments in Memphis. Um, are these competition to transloading activity in LA Long Beach? And if so, what can be done about it? So it's, it's always worthwhile to just step back and, and see, uh, you know, how the theory compares to the reality. And so you don't normally come across this sort of data, but this was from a presentation done by a Norfolk Southern uh, official in Ohio, which looks at the actual uh, intermodal traffic by, by NS's Ohio terminals in 2010. And you can see that, you know, amongst these four terminals, the share of Western U.S., which would include both international and domestic containers, ranges from 35% in Toledo up to 71% in Columbus. Um, so it's, it's, you know, you can't expect that these market shares are going to follow precisely what your, what your model tells you the costs are. So, uh, in answer to the question, <laughs> uh, I think in order to, to take a strategic approach to this, that in the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach have to look at, you know, what is their value proposition? Uh, what is it about shipping uh, containers through this port which can't be duplicated by other locations? Uh, take as an example Canadian imports from Asia. So, my Rough guess is that probably 25% of Canadian imports from, from the Pacific Rim are being transshipped through U.S. ports and sent across the border by truck. 400,000 TUs, roughly. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm pretty sure it's more expensive and slower than Canadian options on direct IPI rail. Uh, it's a big market. Toronto is the third largest market for warehousing in North America. U.S. ports seem to be unaware that they actually serve this market at all. And this goes back to the, the, the data limitations, which I mentioned. The very serious limitation is that nobody knows where the cargo goes after it hits the port. So you definitely need to, I mean, this, the, the, the elasticity estimate suggests that, that traffic is elastic to, uh, to, to cost increases. Um, and there is a relationship with transit time. But really, that's a commodity market. Anybody can play um, on, on uh, reducing costs and, and transit times. And some of these major uh, macroeconomic variables can wipe out whatever advantage you think you've got by improving your systems in, in a heartbeat. Um, <clears throat> so you need to figure out how to differentiate the product. Now, when I look at the numbers and, uh, and realize that the actual market share is very substantially, even within small areas, it strikes me that if you have a situation where the costs are very close, there are probably a number of other factors which lead people to choose one route or another. And it's understanding what those are 
and what the, this, this gateway can offer that other people can't offer that really should be the key strategic uh, issue in terms of um, making your decisions on what you're going to build and, and how you're going to uh, how you're going to position your gateway. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? I know people are going to have to run off very quickly, but if there's a any questions? One thing in that report we can emphasize on is uh, shippers prefer to send their commodities to one port rather than two ports. Because the standard devi I mean, if you have two, des if you send 50% to one place and 50% of the other place, compared to sending all of them to one place, then the variance of the centralized system is square root of, is equal to the variance of the other one. So standard deviation is square root of the, the two. Uh, how do you look at this? Uh, well, centralization. That, that was, uh, and particularly in the phase one report, uh, but when the phase two report, there are also other cases looked at which, which were actually port diversification cases. Uh, because the, re the, re the recognition is that shippers have in fact been diversifying their gateways in order to avoid being too reliant on a single port. Um, so, you know, the, the, the the facts show that, that shippers have been diversifying their port choices. The market shares amongst the various ports sh suggest that they've been diversifying their, their market choices. So there again, as I say, if, if in fact the linkage to uh, inventory costs is much weaker than was thought in the Leachman model, that may explain why they're pursuing diversification, one of the reasons they're pursuing diversification. Um, just out of curiosity, from from LA to Chicago, do you see any opportunities to improve any of the bottlenecks along the way that could indeed help tremendously with regard to the time? Well, there's been a tremendous amount done. And in fact, uh, when I showed the, uh, the, the widening rate differential between the Pacific Northwest ports and LA Long Beach, um, that was actually predicted in Leachman's uh, report uh, because he anticipated that once they'd finished the major improvements on their Southern Transcon network that they would be lowering their rates relative to the Pacific Northwest or being a railway increasing their rates in the Pacific Northwest in order to, uh, to drive more traffic onto their, uh, their refurbished network which had lower costs. And based on the FMC data, at least that seems to be the case. So there has been tremendous investment uh, by BNSF and by UP on their Western networks. It hasn't matched the investment in the, uh, in the Easter, by the Eastern Class 1 railways, but the Eastern Class 1 railways had major infrastructure needs and they could not uh, economically double stack from the East Coast ports because they had clearance problems, they had routing problems, and, and they've spent hundreds of millions of dollars to fix those. Yes? On, on your last slide when you were talking about value proposition, yeah. um, the 25% of the Canadian imports are coming through the U.S. ports. Yep. What, what, I didn't understand your point in that. Are you thinking we should tax those so that they don't do that? <laughs> I don't know what your point was exactly. No, the point was is there's some, some attraction to Canadian shippers to send product through U.S. ports. And it's not transit time and it's not costs. Because the transit time is higher than for shipping through a Canadian port and the cost is more because the, the Canadian US rates to Chicago are more or less comparable. Now, in terms of understanding the value proposition, understanding why that, why that can, Canadian traffic is going through the US, you really need to get down and look at, look at uh, the details. And you can do that through, to some degree through customs data because you can go down to very detailed commodity levels. And a, a significant portion of that, I think, is uh, auto parts. So, and, and because uh, auto production, uh, amongst the foreign uh, manufacturers is, is basically integrated between Canada and US. They have production facilities and distribution facilities on both sides of the border. So, you know, they have options and they, will, they may have factors which uh, are unique to their own situation which, which would lead them to choose one route or another. Okay, well I'm going to say let's, thank you very much because I know people are going to be running out of here to get to their classes. So thank you very much. And anybody who has an extra question can... Yes, I'm here. Yeah.